Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, who is uh, Ewan Clayton. He's a good friend of the program. Uh, he is the one of the instructors in the condensed program, which is just started today. So everything that ends, everything also begins. So a lot of the students are here. So uh, it's great to have you guys here. Ewan's a calligrapher. Um, he's a uh, part-time professor uh, at, uh, of design at the University of Sunderland. Uh, he is also co-director of the International Cal Calligraphy Research Center. Uh, he grew up uh, associated with the uh, community of craftsmen in Ditchling um, in Sussex, uh, which was founded by Eric Gill. Uh, he's had a very illustrious career. He spent a, a good deal of time as a consultant at Xerox Park, a very important influential project. Uh, he is the core faculty member at the Royal Drawing School in London. Uh, and in 2013, he was the uh, awardee of the first Carl York Hoffer Prize uh, by the Schreib Works. Klinkspor for his work in calligraphy and education. That's the guy who did the number plates we were looking That's at. That's right, <laughs> yes, yeah, which I'm going to get some images yep. for. Um, and his wonderful book, uh, The Golden Threat, uh, came out in 2013. 13, and it's been translated into Spanish and Italian and more languages since uh, then? It's just about to be released in Turkish. Turkish, <laughs> there you go. Excellent book. I do encourage you to, to acquire a copy of that if you haven't. So it's my pleasure to welcome you. Thank, Thank you. you, Sasha. Thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation to speak to you again. Uh, my subject this evening is calligraphy into type. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a slightly lighter topic than last year, where we took on the whole question of um, what is writing, <laughs> which, is, which, is a, which is a pretty tough assignment. Um, what I can tell you is I've got good visuals, if nothing else. <laughs> My university paid for some good photographs, so I'm very, I'm very grateful to them for that. So the topic really is it's, we're revisiting the relationship between calligraphy and type. Um, not simply as something that provides um, structural models for type, but rather I want to show you that there are more um, deep stylistic inferences and that they have a continuous history from earliest times until now. We're looking here at the De Eitner sample of the De Eitner type from Aldous Minutius from 1495 from Sutton and Bartram's uh, wonderful The Atlas of Type Forms. And this illustration and the one that follows really shows that one of the fundamental connections between calligraphy and type forms, which lies in the way that the broad-edged pen gave us the shape of our first typographic forms. So the distinctive distribution of weight around the forms, as most of you know, I think, comes from the nature of the tool which produced thick and thin lines in relation to the direction that that square-edged pen moved on the page, now gliding up on an edge and producing a thin stroke, or pulling round a corner to give its maximum width. All of this without any necessary variation in pressure. And this relationship between the pen and the letter form holds good also for many non-Latin uh, script forms. So what I did here was I just literally took a piece of tracing paper, put it down over the forms underneath, took out a felt tip pen of the same width, and I wrote over those forms with that pen nib. So there's no drawing here, no pen manipulation, no faking, it's completely direct penmanship, uh, one shot calligraphy. <laughs> You can see the relationship between the weights and the, the forms underneath. The other relationship, of course, that exists between calligraphy and these forms comes from the rhythmical movements of the hand in writing, which generates a kind of deep structure of echoing curves interspersed with vertical and horizontal elements. So the movement from the ver first vertical in that letter N into the second vertical of that letter N leads to that springing branch out of that first stem. And indeed, all these lowercase letters that we're looking at have derived from Roman capitals through the action of the writing hand, repeating movements again and again and again, um, evolving shapes. So they transform themselves into this alternative script form. 
So I'm showing you there a close relationship between calligraphy and type form. But the story that I grew up with in Britain was that after this initial meeting with typography, um, typography gradually drifted away from its calligraphic basis uh, in, in the European tradition. And books like Sutton and Bartram's An Atlas of Typeforms demonstrate this with um, useful comparative uh, surveys of scripts in enlargement over time. We're looking here at um, uh, a, um, a form from Christopher van Dyck from Utrecht in 1689. And we can see here, uh, al along with that story, that the adjusted emphasis of the weight of the D, for instance, of the, sorry, the B, and the, the um, axis of the G, the way that the um, uh, vertical axis and the horizontal axis have moved to be absolutely at 90 degrees and not tilted over, as in the E, for instance, giving weight to that E. And then if we move forward a few years only to an example of the Romain du Roi from the Imprimerie Royale from Paris in 1702, you can see again an adjustment here also to the weight of the E. The axis has shifted on that E into a more logical correspondence with the axis of weight uh, on, on the B, for instance. And then if we move forward towards um, John Baskerville with this specimen from 1765, we see a rounder, wider form, and although not particularly in this slide, um, a higher contrast between uh, thick and thin, which comes to fruition in work by those such as Giovantista Bottoni from um, before 1818, uh, this coming from his Manuale Typografico, where you have what we would call maybe a modern face with that very accentuated contrast between thick and thin. So this story of calligraphy and type as separate disciplines, as different things, as things that grew apart, actually justified, it, justified um, a certain amount of institutional rivalry in the UK, certainly institutional structures, separation of courses. But the picture that I want to give you is a rather different one. Very different one. I'm showing you a picture from a geography textbook. <laughs> It's the only thing I could find at a short notice to try and explain the kind of image that I have in my mind of the landscape of typography with, on that surface level, identifiable settlements and structures influencing and relating with each other and affecting each other's shapes and forms and pages and structures. But always, as here, with this deep seam of activity flowing through the ground it stands upon. And that deep seam, that aquifer, is alive and moving. It's flowing because it's a continuous activity, not simply just a form. It's the vast, broad sweep of writing itself in all its forms. And very often, this rises to the surface or is tapped from above, and it gushes forth in a spring or a fountain and gathers life round it, new buildings and new settlements flourish. And I be believe this kind of interchange has actually happened throughout the history of calligraphy and typography. Actually, it's strange that I grew up with this notion of the two disciplines as separate in Britain, because, of course, in Edward Johnston's book, Writing, Illuminating, and Lettering, which he published in 1906, he really draws a picture of pulling together knowledge about the lettering arts from multiple sources, as you can see in these pages here, where he's showing the kinds of things that writing and illuminating and lettering can be relevant to. And he has a broad vision, where he's bringing in engraving and sign writing and embroidery and printing and stone carving into this book. So it's ironic that I should actually have grown up with this separated vision. But there was, a, there was a slight problem there. And it was that, um, it was a flaw really, that Edward Johnston's students tended to emphasize in their eagerness to praise their master, the newness of the discovery of the broad-edged pen. 
and in so doing, they risked mischaracterizing the period of history that immediately preceded their own. They characterized it as the period of the pointed pen. Noel Rook, who you see here um, in a broadcast on the BBC from 1945, um, shortly after Edward Johnston's death, is playing up that business of the rediscovery of the edged pen as his fundamental um, contribution. One of Johnston's students, Grady Hewitt, who we see here in a quote from his book on lettering from 1930, um, throws that cloak of slight misapprehension, not just over the immediately preceding era, but actually over the 17th, 18th, and indeed 19th centuries, three centuries maybe of misapprehension. And he gives that argument an extra twist, uh, which comes from an aspect of arts and, dine, uh, arts and crafts philosophy. And that was the dogma that held that tools and materials inevitably determine forms, a kind of material or technological determinism. So that if the medium of reproduction was copper plate engraving, this too would have transformed calligraphic expression. Well, there is truth in this, but maybe not to the extent that became the common understanding that it had actually transformed the whole basis of calligraphy away from the edge pen, and that these forms were basically now just inventions of the engravers rather than the writers. And that seems to be the implication here of this quotation from Grayley Hewitt about the inappropriate influence <laughs> of metal engravers until the connection is hardly recognizable. The trim, definite action of the broad pen has been superseded by the loop and flourished frailty of the flying, pliable nib, Im imitating the dexterities of another craft, in other words, of engraving. And that um, understanding really uh, continued right into the period where I was training as a calligrapher. We see here Heather Child writing in her excellent book, uh, Calligraphy Today, handwriting became devalued when the aid, with the aid of the pointed flexible metal nib, it attempted to imitate the style of lettering used by engravers for printing. This debased style, known as copper plate, offered an opportunity for enjoyable virtuosity, and some calligraphers still succumb to its period charms. So she's, she's growing up out of a period in the 20s and 30s where she was being educated with that idea that we're in a new age now, the age of the broad-edged broad pen, which indeed they were. But what's so interesting is that actually if you look at the evidence, the broad age pen survived throughout that period. And if you look at the work of calligraphers of the 18th century themselves, that you will find them defending themselves from the charge, not that they're imitating engravers, but that engravers had slightly neatened up their forms. <laughs> and in doing so, they explain the process by which the, these books were produced. The calligrapher wrote on paper using ink without gum in it. And then that paper could be directly turned over and burnished onto the copper plate. So engravers were not eyeballing the writing master's lettering, but actually transcribing a physical copy that had been transferred onto their plate. Um, and alas, that perception of the decadent previous era is found in American publications as well, as we find in Donald Anderson's excellent book, The Art of Written Forms. Um, in truth, it is a tiresome panorama, is his conclusion there. So to many of you, this will be um, not unfamiliar territory. So looking at this story is really a part of a bigger project for me of recovering the material and embodied realities that underpin the forms we use. It's part of that project that um, I engaged with here when I wrote my book, The Golden Thread. But I also believe it's, and, and it's what I'm engaging with now as I'm writing a new book, which is about craftsmanship in the village that I grew up in, Ditchling in Sussex. But I believe it's also part of the work of our times because it has implications really for everything from the way we care for our planet, we care for ourselves, and we also care for each other. So in this book, The Golden Thread, I wrote from a changed understanding of what writing is, one that I talked about last year. 
one that I learned at Xerox Park, where I worked as part of an interdisciplinary research team to look at documents, what they are, how we use them, um, and how we use them to bring various kinds of order to our daily lives. This was a diagram that my colleague David Levy produced for us within our research lab for explaining how technologies and artifacts, you might have think of them as written artifacts here, interact with people and their activities and their institutions. And that if anything changes in any one of these areas, inevitably things change in the other two as well. We're living in this kind of change at the moment. So, what I want to do in this lecture is to highlight some of the links between the activity of doing calligraphy and making type, not in theory, but actually in practice. There's been much research in recent years that highlights this link, but really there isn't a place that strings it all together. And so I'd like to share some of what I see with you tonight. The result is a story not of two disciplines growing apart from that foundational moment of Gutenberg's invention. We're looking at um, an illustration from his 42-line um, uh, Bible here. Um, so we're not seeing um, us growing apart from that foundational moment, a kind of big bang, flinging us into differencing forever, but rather, I think, something that um, begs looking at again. So let's begin with re-examining Gutenberg, because in a way, the, the myth of calligraphy and uh, type being different could not be stronger at that particular moment when something, you know, the Gutenberg moment, the Gutenberg galaxy, when something new is, is invented. So it's 16 years ago now since um, Paul Needham and Blaise Aguera y Gargas came up with their question, so what was it that Gutenberg actually invented? Um, and I'm very grateful to Blaise here through Sumner Stone for um, agreeing to lend me some of his slides to show you. He's still very much um, energetically engaged with that work, even though his career has taken him in uh, other directions. It's an interesting opening slide here because what it shows is cuneiform writing in the background. And um, Paul Needham, who's the Scheide Library at Princeton, uh, has worked on Gutenberg and early printing, as you'll know, for many, many years. And he came up with the term cuneiform typography for what they were seeing in um, particularly these studies of uh, the B42 Bible, but also many others of Gutenberg's um, early works. And it came from the idea that, which we'll go into, that what Gutenberg invented was perhaps not the punch as we traditionally understand it, that stamps into a matrix in one go, <laughs> that is slid into a collapsible mode, uh, mold, and that the type is cast in identical form one after another from that same mold, but rather something different. Something different that really came from two facts that they observed. This is actually my own drawing, um, but it's to illustrate this fact. Um, it's that when they analyzed a page of the Bible, and at that time, uh, they would say that it was printed one page at a time, every single letter on that page appeared to be a unique letter. It was not an identical letter that was cast from one mold. What I've done here is I've taken that small slide that we looked at earlier, those few lines of the Bible, I've enlarged them, and then I've gone along that line, um, drawing, tracing, each enlarged letter, these letters that I've drawn are about this big. Um, so as you can see them, and I've drawn them in the sequence that they appear along those lines. So I haven't made any selection here. The first A on the left is the first one in those lines, and then the second one, and then the third. And we've got a line of A's there, but actually there's several sh two sheets of A's. And then we've got some U's, and then we've got some C's along the bottom. And you can begin to see, just looking at those A's, how very different from each other they actually are. The um, various ways that Blaze has looked at this has taken into account things like ink spread and that sort of thing when he's actually analyzing them from his terms. So that was the first 
um, very surprising fact was seeing that these things, as far as they could see, were unique. The other thing that was detected, which was a surprise, was um, microforms within the letters when light was shone from behind them. So if you look here at that A, for instance, that's what I mean by a microform. Um, it's, it, it's something that shouldn't really be there, that, that line. And that doesn't just occur there. You can see it here as well. So, so far from being identical type cast from one parent mold, each casting is unique, maybe sometimes a two-off rather than just a one-off. And within the face of some of these imprints, microforms can be discerned, suggesting that the mold perhaps had been created by a series of punches, building up each letter form, much like the letter would have been written using a series of pen strokes. What we may be seeing here is that at its inception, printing had been much more like a kind of automated writing than we had first suspected. No big bang moment in that sense. There is much that remains to be explored about this discovery, not least who then did think of the single punch and first used it. But the beauty of this discovery is that it shows that the early invention of printing proceeded from thinking about pen strokes, from thinking in a calligraphic way. In other words, from thinking about those units that make up um, a Gothic letter form. To me, it's not a surprising thing to do, because if you think of the challenge of over 400 um, characters or, or combined characters that you're going to produce, and it's a Gothic typeface where the demands of um, the parallel line are really much higher than in any other script form, and this is the first time you've ever done it, and you know you've got to get them absolutely right and the same thickness all the way through. How are you going to control that process over 400 forms, when maybe you've never done anything like that before? To actually have a set of simple prototypes out of which you could build those 400 forms would guarantee a certain amount of unity, visual unity. Looking at my simple page, I worked out that this was roughly the number of strokes that I'd need to do the simplest possible job on the sample that I had. I didn't actually have all the shapes of letters there. I didn't have the round R, for instance, which have demanded two more shapes. And there's one shape missing, which is just the single straight line, the length of that nib width, um, which would be used in the E crossbar and various other letters like the Y. But you can see that uh, that's a fairly small kit. A wonderful concord, proportion and measure of punches and forms, is how the colophon to the, cath the, colophon to the Catholicon of 1460 <coughs> describes this invention. So just revisiting this for a moment, and, and really there's probably a whole talk in this, so I'm just touching briefly on it. I'm finding this um, uh, work at the moment really interesting. And uh, what I'm seeing is there is a clear relation to pen strokes here rather than just to modular units that are being used. And I'm not yet sure quite what I mean by that relationship to pen strokes, how close it is. Are we actually talking writing or are we actually talking stamping? But if you take that, for instance, middle A there, you could say, oh, what's happening here is we're just making a narrow A. So maybe, actually, it's the same casting as A13 there on the left, but it's being rubbed down to uh, make it thinner uh, and narrower. But if you look here, what you'll see, which a calligrapher will immediately see, is actually there's a different pen angle at the bottom there that can't really be ex explained by just rubbing it down. And if you take a pen, which I got curious about, to that pen angle and then complete the stroke, what you find is the width of the stroke immediately above that exactly mirrors what would happen if you'd actually used a pen that wide to move up into the letter. So 
maybe the situation gets more complicated here. <laughs> maybe we have um, not just a simple kit for making A's, but we have curved strokes like this as well. Who knows? I haven't got to the bottom of that yet. But another interesting detail in that top stroke too is that it is actually overlapping to the right at exactly the right amount that would be predicted by holding a pen at that angle and, and moving it in that direction. Some letters I found were extremely easy to write, like this R, these two R's which appear there. They just, I, that was my first attempt. I didn't have to practice it. I looked at it. I was able to do it. Other letters revealed something very interesting. So when I did the C in a sort of classic Gothic way, what we have is a projection at the top, which would obviously be a kerning problem. And that explained to me, because I'd been very puzzled by the letter C's that I was drawing, how although they start at approximately the same angle, this sort of angle keeps repeating pretty much all the way through. But these endings really vary hugely in, in, the, in their angles. But of course, if you were actually having to grind that end off, you might well then have some variability in that end compared to the other end of the stroke. The E was puzzling as well. I'm just throwing up some of the questions that are sort of alive for me at the moment. If I write um, a regular Gothic E, which you see on the left, the thickness of that top stroke is quite wide. But Gutenberg's E is like the one on the right. <laughs> it's much narrower. Um, it's actually very possible to make that still with a pen, but what I have to do is make two strokes, and I'm pulling them in the direction of those, of those arrows. What that does, of course, is it opens up the counter. The, it's possible that that counter on the left really fills with ink. I haven't gone back to look at some of the earlier attempts uh, from the, the um, B42 script to see if this is a transition. But that's one of the things that the calligraphy has thrown up, that we might, for instance, find early attempts are more like the one on the left than on the right. Something like the T, which again was very easy to reproduce, and I could reproduce it completely with a pen, um, even to the funny shape on the left, using the technique we've just used for the E. But the other thing that became interesting was that for some letters, they were incredibly hard to get, unless you got a particular stroke order in mind. And so here's various attempts at the S, which were all disastrous, until I tried that stroke order on the right, when the whole letter just fell into place. Even the sorts of mistakes that I were getting were mistakes in line with what I kind of saw in the Gutenberg S, which is very variable. So what we're seeing there is not a relationship, perhaps, between um, pen strokes, but also sequential movements as well, in terms of the letter construction. And there are lots of other things. Where, where you have parallel lines, for instance, that curve um, symmetrically with each other, that seems another indication of, of pen work. Anyway, this is work in progress, but I'm finding it very interesting. And it's made me um, give credence to what I've read in Paul Needham and Blaze's work. So that's the moment for the inception of printing how perhaps it proceeded, you know, it, why not, <laughs> at a sort of incremental level of understanding and why calligraphic understanding seems to lie behind those first forms. So what about the Roman alphabet? We're looking here at Schweinheim's and Panartz's work from 1465. Um, it's, it's the Lactantius here. These photographs have all come from uh, the John Rylands Library in England, where they have a fantastic department who seem endlessly accommodating to, to one's wishes. I can recommend them to any of you. They have a wonderful uh, incunable co a collection as well. So the capitals, the capital letter, the Roman capital letter. This is probably a story that's familiar to you all. But it's interesting to see the letters that um, they're using right at the beginning of their printing venture in Italy. They bear a close relationship to um, the sorts of letter forms that we find uh, being written by Poggio Bracciolini in, in Florence, or at least originating from him. 
So if you look at the N in Anno, if you look at the splayed M in Ultimus above there, and you move back into here, you'll find those forms are, be, are being echoed here. The Nam at the top left-hand corner, for instance, there. So although the lower case is following what Harry Carter calls a Gothico Antiqua letter, um, the capitals are modeled on a, a more clearly on a Florentine form uh, pioneered by Poggio six decades earlier. Uh, this is, as you can see actually from the date here, this is from 1408, um, one, it's a copy of, of Cicero's letters to Atticus. Now these letters of Poggio's are based on Romanesque Italian practice, the kind of rustic letters that you'd find in Romanesque manuscripts, though maybe with an admixture of purifying Roman epigraphic examples. I say that from really looking at, at um, his early work, which you can see here, which is much more medieval in feel and look. He's not just taking those capitals from the books that he's familiar with. He is modifying and cleaning them up somehow. And visually, it's reminding me of this uh, now lost um, work by Mantegna, which is painting a kind of Republican letter um, that presumably he would have seen somewhere around Padua. So, um, in Schwenheim and Panatz's second Roman type, though, something uh, has, has happened. This is from 1467, once they've moved to Rome. And here, not only has the uh, lowercase form, which we're not concerned with in this particular slide, um, changed, but the capitals have acquired uh, a different underlying form. They've become a kind of epigraphic capital, so that the E has serifs on it, the N is now a classical Roman N. Um, I do feel, though, <laughs> that um, we can see uh, a, a new influence at work, and, and we would say, really, I think, that these capitals um, are coming from a northern Italian influence because for 17 years or more there's been a deep interest in the revival of just such, just such forms centered on Padua in northern Italy. I think as with the lower case, Schwenheim and Panatz are still seeing though with northern European eyes and it's to this that I attribute the elongated L um, in the middle there and also the elongated F and the very swollen P they still have the feel of a northern European versal. But in the other letters, they seem to be coming to terms with a new form of serifing, which we can see in the next slide in, in an early form. You're looking here, if we, if we just go back briefly, so I'm showing you this sort of thing, this sort of thing, this sort of thing. And we see those in these next slides in a subtle form from 10 years or more earlier in what here is Bartolomeo San Vito's earliest known work entirely in his hand. It's a manuscript from the British Museum, Harley 5268. It was written in Padua around 1453-4. to four. Um, And in the um, area above, you can also see that similar form of A as well as the bracketed serifs. We've seen earlier, Bartolomeo made his first visit to Rome in 1464 to 66, and as Paul Shaw has demonstrated, he had an effect there beyond just the manuscript book, possibly into um, stone carving, the work of Andrea Bregno as well. I'm not saying there's a direct influence here at all to Schweinheim and Panat, but I'm saying this is the kind of influence that they're trying to take on. Here you see what happened to Bartolomeo's letters uh, by 1488. This is a, a Eusebian Chronicles, which he wrote in Rome. Um, it's also a British library manuscript. And this is his mature epigraphic style. And we can see how he's modeling his letters on that epigraphic style from the corner of the Roman monument on the left. And that E balanced on top of it, which actually has... Uh, a a V-shaped incision in, in painted into it. 
And this allows me to explain briefly one of those really significant developments in letter, in, uh, in letter form of the period, which flowed from a specific regional culture that I've already alluded to, that based in the northeastern Italian town of Padua, a day's journey from Venice, and the intellectual and scholarly capital of the Veneto. Um, and I should just uh, pause for a moment here, because I'm being a bit casual with my notes, and say that the work we're now looking at um, is coming really from three scholars. Um, Juliet Spontuomi, who wrote an article, Wentz Jensen, A Search for the Origins of Roman Type, originally published in uh, 1987. Uh, Jeffrey D. Hargreaves, whose article Florentine Script, Paduan Script, and Roman Type was published in the Gutenberg Jahrbuch for 1992. And then several articles by the leading Italian researcher in this area, Stefan Zamponi, who's been looking at the origins of humanistic script for more than a decade. And two particular um, seminal articles, which come from 2004 and 2006, respectively. It's they that have been painting this picture that I'm presenting you with here. So back to Padua for a moment. It, from the 13th century, it had hosted a community of scholars interested in the classical world. It had been the birthplace, they thought, of Livy. And local myth had it that Antonor, counselor to King Priam of Troy, was buried there in the city that he founded. The town also significantly had a long history of civic literature about civic affairs, a lively community of notaries and lawyers who played an important part in civic life. In the 1440s and onwards, Alberti returned to the city. From 1443, Donatello moved there to work on a huge equestrian statue, the first to be cast in bronze since Roman times. He would work there for a decade into the 1450s. It was a vigorous intellectual and exciting artistic atmosphere to be in. It was in Padua that we find a conscious effort during these years, as Mommsen put it, to unite classical content with its form and expression. And classical inscriptions became a focal interest, both for their vocabulary and grammar, but also for their letter forms. We see here one of the drawings from Felice Feliciano's groundbreaking book, manuscript book, from 1464. Felice, originally from Verona, worked with Paduan friends, including the painter Andrea Mantegna, to reacquaint themselves with carved classical lettering. And this resulted, and it's Zamponi that really points this out, in two remarkable firsts. This book, the 1464 Book of Letters, the first to show epigraphic forms with their V-shaped incisions. And then a book written entirely in classical letters by um, Felice. And uh, what Stefan Zamponi really says about this is he points out this is highly significant. We haven't had books written entirely in classical uh, capital letters for centuries. It's a project, in fact, to kind of rewrite the history of the book. This was the classical letter form. Why would you write a book in anything else if you were interested in this world? And it's these forms that we see in Padua that are taken up by those early printers. It's, I suppose, ironic that the best exponent of these forms at the time was a painter. It was Andrea Mantegna. You're looking here at one of the uh, cartoons for his tapestry of the triumphs of Caesar. Let's just swoop in on those letters there. there nobody else could do anything like this, I think, at that time. They, they, they convinced you immediately of their pedigree. Um, he's, he's visually really looked at them. And of course, now we know that actually these forms originated from a square edge brush being painted. So good for a painter for somehow making a relationship with these forms. And so it's these forms that we see moving into Johann and Wendelin von Speyer's book, when, books in uh, 1469, when they start printing. Um, there's obviously a lot more one could say about this, but I'm moving swiftly through because we have a few centuries to handle. Um, 
then Nicholas Jensen's work, you're looking here, actually a, a book from 1476, um, a book on grammar that actually belonged to Edward Johnston, this book, and, and belonged to um, Pomponio Leto before that in Rome. Um, and then, obviously, into the work of Aldous Minutus. We're looking here at his capitals for um, his De Eichner project from 1496. You'll notice the balance here. It's quite heavy, in fact, which is something that he um, provided an alternative for. Um, you're looking here, it's in the polyphily type, but you're looking here not at the polyphily book, but rather li the Liber De Imaginatione from 1501, which had a, a, a crisp, fresher casting, which James Mosley pointed out to Stan Knight, and Stan pointed out to me, which is how I then got this image. So you're seeing there that these classic forms at their beginning are coming in from a scribal tradition which has behind it an epigraphic tradition. So what of the lowercase forms? Well, we know that Poggio and his friends in Florence, um, his collaborators in Florence, modeled their hands on northern Italian Carolingian examples, such as this, which is now in a Venetian library. But what we, and, and here's a detail of that kind of hand. But what we also know, thanks to Hargreaves and others, is that this Italian humanist hand had its own variations. And he's grouped them into two broad groups. The Florentine, as is this manuscript from the, uh, from the British Museum. And, and this kind of um, writing is, um, is the usual sort that's shown when you are looking at humanist minuscules. And then the Paduan, which we see here in a manuscript from 1432, which is already showing a form that is more separate and finished, with serifs on the base strokes of various letters. I haven't been able to get a new photograph from the British Library for this. This is just the one from their website, and it's very crude resolution. But if you look at the feet of ends, you actually it's a, it's a slab serif at the foot there, rather than simply a tick. And that's 1432. The Florentine one, though, as you can see, is more flowing, more joined. It has um, serifs that are more rounded. By the mid-1460s, as we see in this Cicero, written in Padua around 1464, there are some very interesting experiments going on, reinventing the lowercase form. And they show a mixture of upper and lowercase forms. There's an attempt here to relate to the now dominant epigraphic Roman capital um, in terms of thinking through what an ordinary book script should actually look like, much as Felice had tried to do um, when he was writing a book entirely in capitals. So what we have here is a hybrid script that has capital and lowercase letters mixed together, much like we see in some early 20th century typographic experiments. So we have capital R's and A's and M's and a really weird H looming there in the bottom line. Um, and that's uh, not an untypical manuscript. Here is another one which I've reproduced from, um, oh gosh, this actually is from Zamponi's um, article. So uh, this is in, um, uh, in Padova, in the Biblioteca Seminario. And it's a book from the third quarter of the 15th century, and it's showing a typically Paduan script. It's got various capital letters actually through this, but it's also got that very distinctive um, finish to the feet of the minim stroke. In fact, it's quite interesting to see this, because if you compare it with Despira's um, first attempts at a Roman, this is relatively close. It has, for instance, um, This decision about the capital H, where you have a calligraphic tail to the H rather than a, uh, a slab serif on both feet. And then uh, here, in a manuscript again from Padua from 1465, we actually find almost all the decisions that Jensen will make when he's designing his Roman have been anticipated, even if somewhat crudely. Um, executed. So there's, there's the classic H here, uh, which is no longer rounded, but has foot serifs on both sides. We have a kind of attempt at epigraphic serifs, 
literally not just dashes, but almost modeled um, like this on the feet. We have some of those capital letters like that R in the second line up. Um, we have uh, foot serifs on the R and the I and the D that are flat rather than rounded. The A retains roundness. We have a point to the bottom left corner of the B. We do still have a rounded T. And we have a rather funny U, which is pointed as well. So in Padua, the pressure for Roman lowercase forms to somehow fit to a classical context is actually coming from almost all directions, from the development and practices of the capitals themselves, from the built environment of the city, its sculpture and architecture, and from a shift in the presentation of the book as a whole that Zamponi has pointed out. And I'm here showing you um, the epigrams of Marshall written by San Vito uh, in Padua between 1466 to 69. It's a Bodleian manuscript. What Zamponi's saying is even the architecture of the page has become an entirely classical architecture, an all antica architecture. So everything in there, the, apart from the shields, <laughs> but everything in there is, is echoing the Roman world. You know, and you're, this is just one page of many hundreds that we could show you. So that again, this atmosphere of the page is pressurizing us towards the lowercase moving also into this classic, classical um, orbit. And I'm showing you a slight oddity here. This is actually from 1469. It is one of the Despira's books. Um, but rather astonishingly, and I discovered this when I was consulting it at the Rylands Library, and it actually hadn't been um, uh, commented on before. That page on the left is type, is, is type. The page on the right is handwritten. <laughs> There's three or four pages at the end of the book that is handwritten, but it's not quite handwritten as you would know. Because if you look at it really closely, and I had to look at it really closely, you'll occasionally find that. What that seems to reveal is the handwritten form is over the top of um, a very grayed out printed copy underneath. So actually, this is a very faint impression on the page. And somebody has then written the text over the top of it. But the point of it, and I, and I think the date is somewhat later than the original issue, but I haven't come to that. Um, but what it shows you is that these letters can actually be written. That's what it shows you. Because nobody had noticed it. <laughs> so these are the forms, then, that come into print with the Despira brothers and with Nicholas Jensen. You're looking here at Jensen's first production from 1470. And um, you can see that Paduan R up in the top right-hand corner. And even when we move forward to um, Aldous, which you're looking at here, um, where he's doing a lighter weight version of that original Jensen, lighter weight, which was then the fashion among scribes in that area by the time he was printing. You'll still also have calligraphic flourishes and things. Look at the alternative M and the alternative T, which we, we find here. And obviously that shape to the top of the A you see in the bottom line, which really echoes the, the sort of shape you get when a pen lifts off the page. Now I'm not going to go into the origins of italic here, because I think that the, it's just so obvious the relationship between the written um, hand and the typeface. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done. You're looking here at the earliest, one of the earliest uh, manuscript examples of San Vito's italic. A lot of work has to be done into looking at what the origins of um, italic actually are in terms of scribal traditions. But I think we can say quite securely that they, again, are Paduan. Um, and uh, we're looking now, then, at, at the 1501 um, uh, Virgil, that was the first outing for Aldous, uh, not the absolute first, because there's a tiny inscription in an illustration where he's using an italic type, but um, the first outing in a, in a, a book form for Griffo's um, italic. Though the form of that book, we could say, comes again from a scribal tradition, because he says it does. He says it comes from books that I found in you, Pietro Bembo, he's writing to, in your father's library, Bernardo Bembo. And uh, 
which contained small handbooks of the classics, which now Aldous was producing. And of course, we know that in Bembo's library, there were those small handbooks of classic um, Roman poets, written indeed, and in that form was developed by uh, Bartolomeo San Vito. They were like this format here. But what's interesting, of course, is that scribes writing that sort of hand didn't stop writing it once printing was invented. They kept on writing it. They didn't cease that tradition. Um, and so what we're seeing here, uh, for instance, in a manuscript from Berlin, is Arrighi's version of that um, form. Or here is another, which suggests an almost sans-serif treatment of some of the serifs. Or here is the Mirandola Hours from the early 1500s, which keeps the lig ligature in close and a close connection in the writing, and uh, a foot that still has a more calligraphic kind of flourish to it. But what you're seeing here are not simply imitations of type, but a form that's still developing amongst a community of scribes who are still writing books. Uh, much of and of course it entered the world of the writing masters too, as one of the scripts that they felt they had to be able to show that they could do. You're looking here at um, Cresci and his Esemplare from 1560. And there's many instances of it in the writing master's books. So already, uh, 20th century commentators were beginning to dismiss the work we've just been looking at as scribes now imitating print, and so unworthy of notice. But uh, actually, this form it ha is multiform <laughs> and, and developing. We're looking here at one of the books from the Sistine Chapel, perhaps written in this case by Cressy and in New York's public library. Cressy continued to work as a scriptor for the Sistine Chapel alongside his scriptorship in the Vatican Library. Um, and in his Esemplare, he produced his version here of what he called the queen of all the hands. And I quote for him, apt for writing missals, service books for princes, lords, and great prelates. In other words, not an everyday hand, but something that he was doing here for a pope. Although he recommends using two pens to write this with, a small one for tricky bits for retouching. <laughs> now, the tradition for writing this kind of script in the Sistine Chapel <coughs> seems to have gone on longer than we suspected, into the 17th century. And I'm thankful, actually, to Cara for pointing this out to me, who noticed it one evening browsing on the newly digitized um, uh, records of the Vatican Library's collection. So this dates from the 1630s, and it contains a number of hands. It's another book written for the Sistine Chapel. One of those hands, not this one, but this one here, can be identified as the hand of the Franciscan monk Fulgentius Brunus. He wrote at least five other manuscripts for use in the Sistine Chapel, now all in Spain, with dates as late as 1638. Um, in a very un-monk-like un fashion, he's the only person in these books who actually signs and dates his work. <laughs> uh, I'm very grateful to him for doing that. <laughs> it would be over, uh, and here's some of his work. Uh, it's interesting because although it's very carefully constructed, it has slightly cursive elements to it. So that E, for instance, with the um, pull round on the stroke coming in, it's a very practiced hand. Um, it would be a bit over a century later that uh, Bodoni would find himself working in Rome. Um, but already it's clear to me that uh, in the 17th century, Italian traditions were anticipating the direction that he would take with that high contrast between thick and thin strokes. Um, and it's not inconceivable to think that his patron, Cardinal Spinelli, who would have been familiar, potentially, with service books from the Sistine Chapel, would have taken a promising young uh, typographer to look at letters like that. It casts a slightly different note uh, on the note that he includes in his Manuale um, where he talks about sharpness of definition, neatness and finish being desirable in letters because they reflect the beautiful contrast as between light and shade, which comes naturally from any writing done with a well-cut pen held properly in the hand. 
Well, France too had its continuing tradition of written Romans, seen in the hands of court scribes of Louis XIV, of whom the most notable was Nicolas Charry, but there were up to 36 other named individuals who've been identified. In their hands, as in the Italians, we're looking here at um, uh, Nicolas Jarry's hand, in their hands, as in the Italian um, hands, this sharper contrast between thick and thin is preserved, and the forms are developed. Um, Jerry has his own typical ways of writing A's with much bigger kicks on the tail. And this hand is minute, though. Uh, this book is in the letter form archive, and I'm grateful to Rob Saunders for allowing me to, to show this. This is another piece of writing by Nicolas Jarry in, in a larger format. It's a very skilled, controlled work of fairly direct um, edged penmanship. And here, in the, uh, I'll, I'll just ca I'll come back to that. <laughs> and here, in the, ra in the hand of uh, Jean-Paul Rousselet, active in Paris between 1677 and 1736, we see another manuscript, one in fact which Louis XV gave to his wife at their marriage. Um, we see, and this is all handwritten, we see letter forms that remind us of what will happen in uh, the work of uh, Baskerville maybe 30 to 40 years later. That broad topped A, the balance of the weight around the D, the E. Um, and just for the students who uh, listened to Sasha's talk this afternoon, he, this scribe also developed stenciled letters, which you can see here. This is some of his stenciled letters. And um, that's one of the way that this kind, this kind of writing could actually have, have uh, been carried across to Britain or carried elsewhere and seen through metal letters like these in stencil form. So there's a tradition there in France, there's a tradition in Italy, and there's a tradition in Britain. Baskerville, um, as Beatrice Ward has told us, uh, was himself drawing on calligraphic sources. The round text Roman practiced by contemporary English writing masters and seen here in a page from Ward's original article from I think it was 1931 or 29, around that period, um, when Monotype were reissuing Baskerville. And um, she's showing that there's a close relationship between Baskerville's letters and the writing of George Shelley in his Alphabets in All the Hands, produced in 1710. As I've uh, talked about here before and have written about in my book, that such hands were written with a formal edged pen rather than a pointed one is attested to in many manuals. We're looking here at an illustration from Jean-Baptiste Allais, The Art of Writing, from 1689. And what we see here is the typical pen cut for that kind of um, letter form. And you see the action where the thin stroke is being drawn by the left-hand edge of the pen. Uh, the nib slit is off-center. So you have a thick side of the pen on the left-hand side when we look at it. Oh. What are we doing? Oh, well done. My battery's running out. <laughs> I did get up at 4.30 to put this lecture together. <laughs> your battery's doing well. Just your laptop. Oh, that's not the right thing. Okay, I've got one. <laughs> this is what we need. Oh, except for that British... No, I've got a, pl chance, got a chance for me at the end. There we go. That, there, that goes in. Okay. Plug it. Yes, it does. That's an adapter. I know it doesn't look like your plug. Yeah, it's lit up. Thank you, Cara. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just showing how, how those kind of Roman letters might have been written. The, the key thing here to notice in that drawing at the top is that the uh, central split in the nib is off to one side. What that does is something very interesting. It introduces a pen, which, um, well, I'm thinking of Nordsee's book, The Stroke, here, which he really should include as an addition in the book, because you've got a, a pen here which does translation and expansion at the same time, because you have a weakened left-hand side to the nib. 
So it's incredibly flexible, and you can really get a wide thing from this pen. But the other side of the nib is very rigid, so that's what you can draw the thin line with, um, and it will stay pretty secure and strong. Yes, I have, and I've tried writing with it too, yeah. And I found instructions for these in Portuguese writing manuals, German writing manuals, French writing manuals, and English writing manuals. Not just in picture form, but in writing. Um, John Clark's writing book, uh, Writing Improved, um, has a whole paragraph about how to cut a pen like this. I find it actually, the terminology is very interesting here, because they talk about the thumb side and the finger side. And that's quite, you can get very confused between left and right when you're talking about nibs. But if when you're holding a pen, you talk about the thumb side and the finger side, if you're not left-handed, um, <laughs> that actually can help sort out some of that dialogue. So um, how are we doing for time? I've got no idea of time. What is the time? Could somebody tell me the time? <laughs> Sorry? 45. OK, fine. I've been 45 minutes. Um, so uh, what, we're, what we're looking at now, we're moving into the final section of the talk. Um, Jarry and the French scribes, so you're seeing the time that Jarry here was active in 1661. Jarry and the French scribes also developed um, a different italic based on hands such as those shown in Cressy's Esemplare, which you see here. It's much more rounded than the traditional italic. Um, I show here from a manuscript by uh, Claude Gilbert from 1689, which belongs to Rob Saunders, the letter form archive. I show his italic. Uh, this again is minute. It's maybe um, one and a half millimeters high. Um, yeah, it's really, really, really tiny. Um, what you see here is that this italic developed by the French court scribes provides a precedent for Fournier's later suggestions for reforming Italic, which you'll find in his Manuale of 1764. We're looking at 1689 here. Um, and his aim there was, to quote him, to bring them closer to our style of writing. Um, letters that I point out to you are things like um, The height of the capital C, which is quite high, but it's also the roundedness of the, the arches. It's like a compressed Roman, in a way. And that does seem to be the influence that's behind this, which is um, uh, Fournier. You can get the same feel of texture from it. And here. So Baskerville, too, drew from contemporary sources when he was developing his italic, which, as we can see, has got none of that French influence in it at all. Um, it's, a very, it's got very pronounced lead-in and lead-out strokes. It's got that rather quirky P that you can see there. Um, the, the, the closest match, I think, actually, is George Bickham's uh, Universal Penman's um, example of formal italic. But, uh, let's just look at um, George Shelley's italic, which you see here. And it actually, it has that similar feel. If you look at the M and the N, the M and the N here, Shelley's is more sloped. The G, you look at the G there. Um, oh, I haven't got a G here. Sorry. Oh, is there? Yeah, one at the top there. The balance of the bowl. Uh, the nature of that B. Oops. And then uh, here's another uh, formal italic uh, from Joseph Campion's um, hand from, again, a few decades before Baskerville was working. And you can see that what Baskerville is doing is the same project, in a way, that um, Fournier was doing, but he's drawing on British sources rather than French sources. And here's um, the example from uh, Bickham. And Bickham has that funny thing on the P that you can see there. Um, interestingly, if we go back, the first place that I found it 
or that we can find it, it's obviously not me, is here in, 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 um, in creches. So, I'm well to time this evening. <laughs> uh, what I've been showing you, really, is a picture from Gutenberg through to the development of Roman upper and lowercase letters of uh, uh, what Emery, well, what Cobden Sanderson actually called this sort of ever-fluent prototype, that's the written hand, feeding into the landscape of typography at various quite key points in the development of typographic form over a, over a considerable number of centuries. And of course, that continued into the 19th. What you're looking at here is some of the calligraphic experiments of William Morris. This is uh, a book that he wrote. And it was really seeing this close connection between calligraphy and typography in the magic lantern slides that his friend Emery Walker produced in 1888 at a lecture for the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society uh, in, in Regent Street, that he saw the need for somehow bringing calligraphy and typography back together again. It's because if they wanted to revive the book and book typography, which they resolved to do on the walk back from that talk to Hammersmith. They walked back to Hammersmith. Quite a dangerous thing to do, though not so much for a man at that point, because Jack the Ripper was out. He'd murdered somebody the previous <laughs> night. So walking back in streets that were not lit to Hammersmith was quite a big deal. Um, and they, um, they, they resolved to found the Kelscott Press on that walk but they realized this link with calligraphy. And that's why, really, when Edward Johnston came along and showed his work, he was welcomed with open arms, because they knew they had to somehow revive a school of calligraphy if they wanted their typography to be alive. And you're looking here, then, at the work of one of the 20th century um, masters who worked both as a calligrapher and a type designer. This is um, Johnston's italic for Count Kessler um, that you're looking at here. And we could have drawn also on the example of Rudolf Koch um, as well, for instance, for this. And then there is a whole cluster of stars around us who have proved this to be a very fertile connection for themselves, from Jan Schickold to Jovica, Sumner, and Hernan and, and Gudrun as well, uh, Zapf, um, and in her case, von Hesse. So I commend to you to rethink um, that division, which may not exist in your minds, but unfortunately to us in uh, the English-speaking world on the other side of the Atlantic, it's been all too present. Uh, and to think of this as a continuing uh, partnership that actually has been influential at not just the Big Bang moment, <laughs> which maybe is not such a Big Bang, <laughs> um, but actually continuously down to the present time. Thanks very much for your patience. <laughs>